Now we're in part two of modeling with FAST, and we're going to use the uh, rate functions we've talked about. We're going to start combining them to try to get an understanding of our population. So we're going to use growth, mortality, and recruitment, and look at these under our various conditions, and this will help us it's never going to be a perfect answer. It's never going to tell us everything, but at least it's better than a guess. And at least it gives us some, some idea of what's going on in our population. So what kind of things can we model? Now, there's all kinds of stuff, but in FAST we can model things like yield, which is the kilograms of fish harvested per year. Uh, and also biomass, so the total biomass that's in the population. Uh, you can model the numbers that would be caught each year and the average size of fish that would be caught under a variety of scenarios. And you can model the SPR. So a lot of these things that we've been talking about can all be modeled in FAST. A couple of names that we're going to throw out here, Beverton Holt and Ricker. These are pretty much the big names when it comes to all these classic fisheries models. These are 1960s guys. Uh, that period where everybody was doing a lot of good modeling. Ricker is a big name, but the Beverton Holt yield per recruit model is sort of the standard. So if you hear those terms, if you hear those thrown out, that's what's built into FAST and that's sort of what we're talking about. We're not going to get into the details of how each of these models work, but just realize that that's the guts that's running in FAST. Okay, so Let's look at an unfished population first. And what do you think is going to happen in an unfished population? Well, all the fish are going to grow. Each individual fish is going to grow. And so the total biomass of the population grows. Now, one thing I want to say right off the start as we do all these modeling, realize that, that when we do these models, we're kind of just talking about a cohort all the fish that were born in a single year and we're following that cohort until the last individual of that cohort dies. Pretty much traditional ecology method. And we can do this and then you know our results will be valid. We can extrapolate to the rest of the population. So it's just easier to think about of a cohort. So all these fish are born at the same time. Every one of them grows. If you could scoop them all up and weigh them periodically, you'd have the total biomass of the population. It's going to get bigger and bigger as each fish gets bigger and bigger. Okay, well we don't have any fishing, right? So there's no fishing mortality, but there is natural mortality. And so we're going to have some natural mortality, but even though fish are dying and that biomass is no longer counted in the total, the rest keep growing and they keep growing at such a rate to compensate for those ones that die so the biomass still will continue to increase even though some fish are dying. The rest of them are all growing so fast. But eventually of course as the cohort ages that mortality is going to catch up and enough fish are going to die that biomass is going to start going down. The fish, of course, are going to probably stop growing, but even if they didn't stop growing, more and more of them are going to die, and so then the biomass sort of peaks and drops off. And that's what Slip and Messina are trying to show in this graph here. That uh, we have age on the x-axis, the biomass on the y-axis, and there's no exploitation. So as the fish get older and they grow, you get this maximum biomass and in this ascending limb here there are some fish dying but everybody's growing so fast that you don't even notice but at some critical age then the loss of biomass due to natural mortality outstrips the increase in biomass that you get due to growth and the total biomass begins to descend until it reaches zero after the last fish has died. So now let's look at a fished population. So if we add fishing mortality, if we start fishing in this population, 
you're of course going to see less total biomass in the population. Makes sense, right? I mean, if you're pulling fish out, you have to, they, their biomass doesn't count to the total po population biomass. So what you can do in FAST and what you can do with these models is observe changes in minimum length and to see how that affects the biomass. This is, of course, one thing you can do, but this is one of the common things you do with these kind of models. So you're going to say, I've got this theoretical unfished population. Now I'm going to allow fishing. But, of course, with fishing, I'm going to have some minimum length limit, right? You can't just take any old fish. There's a minimum size you can take. I can look at different minimum sizes, and I can see how that is going to affect the total population biomass. And that's what they're showing with this graph. Same axes as before. The solid black line is the same unfished population biomass. And now you can see what happens um, as we add fishing to this model. And so the dotted line um, is a high minimum length limit, relatively high, and a relatively low minimum length is shown on the dashed line. So study this for a second and see if it doesn't make sense to you. So let's look at the high minimum length. So we, we're adding fishing, but you can't take the fish until they get relatively big. And so what happens? So the, the curves are identical up until the fish become pretty large where they recruit to the fishery and then they start getting pulled out. And that is the point where we reach this inflection in the total population biomass and the biomass starts to drop off. Again, now we're thinking about just a single cohort. Um, we're following this one cohort through the lives of all the fish in the cohort. So when all those fish reach about age two, they seem to recruit to the fishery. They're big enough, they're pretty big, and we start pulling them out and we see the biomass of the cohort starts to decrease because that fishing and the natural mortality is outstripping the rate of replacement. Okay, now let's look at the lower minimum length limit in this dashed line. And so now these fish, now we're allowing uh, fishermen to take the fish when they're at a relatively small size and at a young age. And you see that this peak occurs at a younger age. And so the fish don't grow very much and they get yoinked out by the fishermen so that the total biomass of the cohort um, begins to decline and the total biomass never reaches anywhere near the unfished biomass because the fish never get a chance to grow very big. You're yoinking them out much sooner than with the high minimum length limit. And so you get a difference in these curves and a difference relative to the unfished population. So this is just one, eye, one idea or one way that you can use the models to evaluate, say, different regulations and to see how they're going to affect the biomass of the population. Now, a more traditional use of these models is to model yield. So instead of modeling the biomass that's out there in the population, you're going to model what the fishermen are taking every year. And that's a more typical use of, of the FAST software and of these kinds of models. And so this is an example of the type of output that you can get from FAST when you're trying to, to do this sort of modeling. So let's look at this graph here. You have exploitation on the x-axis. Remember that that's uh, the percentage of fish that are removed by the fishermen. Um, and you have yield on the y-axis, and so that's the total amount of kilograms of fish that are removed and that presumably can be sold and you can make money off of. And then what we're looking at here is we're exploring the effect of two different length limits. One is 254 millimeters, one is 356 millimeters. 356 is red, 254 is blue, as you can see. So, um, what's this tell us? Uh, we see that uh, as exploitation gets higher, so as, as we go up on the x-axis, that means what? 
that means there's more exploitation. That means that there's more fishing going on. There's more fishing pressure. Exploitation is the percentage of the fish that are being caught by the anglers. So as that goes up, that means you're catching, you're fishing harder. So what we're seeing is, is what happens to the total yield brought in as we fish harder. Okay, but we're also seeing at the same time what happens if they're allowed to take the fish at a, at a relatively small minimum length versus a relatively long minimum length. And you see that the yields are quite different. Let me uh, back up for just a second. Let's, let me talk about this one just a little bit more. You'll look, and if you think about this, this graph should make intuitive sense, okay? The blue line is a relatively small minimum length, meaning the fish don't have to get very big before they can get yoinked out by the fishermen. So what happens to the total yield relative to the other length limit? It's much less, right? Because you're, you're taking the fish when they're very small, and so you don't get a lot of yield. Whereas if you use the red line, which is the longer minimum length limit, that means that the fish have to get bigger before you can take them. So you're taking bigger fish, and it turns out over time you're getting much more yield because you're getting those bigger fish. And for the same fishing effort, so if you go along the x-axis, that shows you fishing effort, and no matter what the fishing effort, you're always getting more yield from the longer length limit, which makes sense because you're getting bigger fish. Now, uh, we want to point out in this blue line, this inflection point, okay? And if you, that's the point where if you fish harder, you actually get less total yield. And that's called growth overfishing. So earlier we talked about recruitment overfishing, and that's where, again, break it down, overfishing is fishing too much. Recruitment overfishing was fishing too much, and you're affecting recruitment. Now, growth overfishing is you're fishing too much, and you're affecting growth, meaning that you're taking these fish before they can, uh, before they can maximize their size. Or, um, let me think about it, if you fish so hard, you're taking these fish, before they can get to a, a, a size to maximize your yield. And so if you fish less, you actually get more total yield because you're giving those fish a chance to grow bigger. That's the whole idea behind growth overfishing. And so if you follow that minimum, that smaller length limit, you see that we're fishing harder and harder and harder. So at the upper end of the x-axis, you know, 70 some percent of the fish are being caught by the fishermen, but the yield is very, very low because they're catching so many small fish. And again, you've got a small length limit, so you're allowed to take those small fish. Um, whereas if you use the same length limit, but you reduce the fishing effort so you don't go out as much, the more of those fish uh, are allowed to grow bigger and you maximize yield. So the fish are plumper and you're catching more fish above that minimum length limit and that's how you can get greater yield with less effort. Of course this benefits everyone because uh, the fishermen have less cost because they're putting in less effort, but they're getting maximum yield. So that's one of the counterintuitive things that you first learn when you start studying these fisheries models. The important message here is that growth overfishing is when you're fishing too much and you're not maximizing your yield. Now, will this be critical to the fishery itself? I'm not sure. It doesn't seem like it, right? It seems like you're being inefficient, but will it necessarily hurt the population? Maybe not. Whereas recruitment overfishing seems to be more serious, where you could actually get a population crash. And again, you also are able to see here that by having a longer length limit, you're actually getting much, much more yield 
with the same amount of fishing effort. And so it, there's a benefit to having this longer length limit. And um, of course, there, there are other non-commercial um, benefits to having a longer length limit. You know, these fish are going to be able to spawn more and, and things like that. Okay, so here is a figure from a paper that I was a co-author on where we applied these types of models to data on shovelnose sturgeon in the, um, the middle Mississippi River, I believe, or maybe the upper, I can't remember. Um, at any rate, Rob Colombo was the driving force behind this. And if you look here, um, you see a similar graph to what we just looked at. Now you'll note here that on the x-axis we have conditional fishing mortality, not exploitation. Uh, essentially though you can think of them as the same thing. Here um, we're just using conditional fishing mortality uh, just for convenience remember that that's the fishing mortality you would get as if there were no natural mortality. Um, we're doing this for modeling purposes but it is the same effect as the previous graph. As you go up on the x-axis and go to the right on the x-axis then you are getting uh, more fishing effort. You'll also note that conditional natural mortality is held constant at 5% as we do these models which is pretty standard and and it's pretty standard you know what values are held um, which are held constant and, and which ones are allowed to vary and so we're looking at the yield of the sturgeon based upon the conditional fishing mortality um, we note there's a couple of vertical bars that we added to this graph. Those vertical bars represent the best guess at current fishing mortality rates on the river at the time that this was published. So based upon catch data, based upon what we knew about the anglers, um, this was the range of what, what the fishermen were um, the exploitation that the fishermen had on the river at that time. Um, so I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but this was sort of the low estimate of fishing effort, and this was the high estimate of fishing effort. So somewhere in here is a realistic estimate of the exploitation by the by the fishermen on the middle Mississippi River uh, shovel nose sturgeon. Okay, and of course we have yield on the y-axis. And we've got three different proposed length limits. And this was in relation to the new regulations that were being put on shovel nose sturgeon. And they were talking about several different length limits and which ones do they want to use. Uh, the black circles is going to be the shortest length limit. The black triangles is going to be the longest length limit. And you see similar to re results to what we saw before in that um, the longer the length limit the maximizes the yield but the the curves flatten off in a different way on each of those curves the little star little asterisk that you see that represents the inflection point where you get growth over fishing beyond that point so what does this tell you from the shovel nose data if you look at the proposed length limits you'll see that um, at the shortest length limit, the inflection point where growth over fishing occurs is right about our estimate of the lowest, the lowest rate of fishing that's going on on the river. And so if true fishing on the river is this low, we are right at the point of growth over fishing based upon this shortest length limit. And if there's any if the fishing is any harder, which it probably is because we're being conservative, it's more likely that the true rate of fishing is in this area somewhere, then with that smallest length limit, we've got growth over fishing. And so by reducing the fishing effort, we would actually get more yield of sturgeon out of the river. Now, if you look at this, you see that it kind of is a flat curve, and so um, it might not be it might not be a huge change, but you get the idea of how we would use the model. If you look at the, the middle length limit, 
you see that the inflection point is right at the highest estimate of fishing that's going on at the river. So um, if the fishing were to drop off, you would um, probably get a little bit less yield or again, the curve is very flat, but if the fishing is any higher, again, you're getting growth, you're getting growth over fishing. Whereas if you look at the, uh, the longest proposed length, you would have to fish really, really, really hard. Fishing pressure would have to more than double to get anywhere near growth over fishing, but you'll also note how that yield curve really flattens out. So, so any rate of fishing is going to give you about the same yield if you had that longest um, minimum length limit. Now, I'm pretty sure, I'll have to go double back and ch go back and double check, but I think the shortest length limit is about 24 inches, and I think that's what they eventually chose as the length limit for the regulation. So um, if that's true, and uh, if our estimates of fishing pressure are correct, um, and if our estimates of fishing pressure are conservative, which I think they are, then that suggests that there is growth over fishing going on in this fishery, and we'd actually benefit by reducing fishing, we'd get more yield of the shovel nose. So again, more effort gives less yield. How is that possible? Um, how can you fish harder but not get more fish? Well, in growth over fishing, you're taking those fish out before they are allowed to get big. And so you're, um, and also, you know, as you uh, fish more, you're pulling more fish out. There are fewer fish out there. You have to work harder. So even though you're fishing harder, you're getting fewer fish each gear pull. There's a lot of things that are influencing this. And so it's basically because you're not allowing those fish to grow that you're actually getting less yield. Um, so we need to reduce effort and we'll actually increase yield. So how do we reduce effort? That's regulations or quotas, right? You, you limit how uh, often people can go out, you give them quotas, and once their quotas filled, they can't fish anymore, you do gear limits, all those regulations that the commercial people use are, can be used to reduce the effort and actually maximize the yield um, for all the fishermen. Um, the trade-off here, the trade-off is that, um, you know, sometimes they're, they're you get fewer people in the that, that can actually go and fish. So if you've got if you're reducing entry into the market, then that means that there's a lot of people who would like to fish but can't because the quota has been filled. Um, you're going to get um, you know bigger fish. You're going to catch uh, probably fewer fish, but they're going to be bigger on average. That's great. But uh, the big problem is is that. Um, that yield is going to, the, the money you get from that yield is probably going to go to fewer people. Okay, so let's look at another graph taken from FAST. The same example as before, and we're looking at the number of fish caught versus the exploitation rate, <coughs> same minimum length limits. And again, this probably should make intuitive sense that at the longer minimum limit, minimum length, you're catching fewer fish no matter what the exploitation, right? If you have to wait for those fish to get bigger before you can take them, then that means you're going to end up taking fewer fish. So again, that's one of the trade-offs of having this longer length limit is that you catch fewer fish total. But the average weight of those fish is going to be bigger in this example. So again, we have exploitation on the x-axis and we have the average weight of each fish on the y-axis. And you see 
that with that longer minimum length, although we're catching fewer fish, on average they're bigger, and if you go back to our very first graph, you'll remember that the total yield was greater with the smaller, with the larger minimum length, and that's how you can get a greater yield. You're catching fewer fish, but they're allowed to grow, so they're bigger, you get more yield. Doesn't always work out that way. That's one thing I want to point out here, is that that's for this example, but it might not work out that way, and so that's why you have these models. Remember that the models are taking inputs on um, the number of fish at each age, the growth rate of the fish, the number of fish that are caught by the fishermen, all these things combine in complex ways. That's why you need a model. So you can put them all together and look at all these variables across a range and you can see um, what happens to your population under these different theoretical conditions. Now I think this is the the next one is the last kind of theoretical yield that we're going to look at here. These are also things that you get from FAST. These are very cool. They're called yield isopleths. And um, what are we looking at here? You've got exploitation on the y-axis as before. This time you've got total length on the, excuse me, on the exploitation is on the x-axis. Now you've got total length on the y-axis. And that's total length, that's the, um, the minimum total length uh, for this fishery. So now we're going to vary all these, instead of looking at just two minimum lengths, we're going to vary them and see how they change as exploitation changes. And then we get these curves that tell us the yield at different combinations of a minimum length versus an exploitation. If you notice at the bottom or at, at the top two, that we're holding natural mortality steady, just like we did before. And um, you see the different colors representing the different levels of yield. So these are isopleths, which you're probably familiar with. These are combinations of a minimum total length and an exploitation rate which give the same value of yield. And so because of all these factors sort of interacting at the same time, you get different combinations of things which give you the same answer. And this is a way with this isopleth graph to combine them all together. So um, let's look at this. This is the maximum yield isopleth. There might be a little this might be a little bit more of the maximum yield, but it's so small, we're going to use this one as the maximum yield isopleth. And so what does that isopleth mean? Anywhere on that line will give you a combination of a minimum total length and an exploitation rate that will give you the maximum yield. So there's there are many ways to skin a catfish. There's many ways that we can maximize the yield in this fishery. So, for example, if you look at the bottom of that isopleth, let's say we set the minimum length at 280 millimeters, and we set exploitation at about 55%, then we're going to get a maximum yield, and it's going to be about 15 kilograms, or between 13 and 15 kilograms. But we can maximize our yield by setting the minimum length at 280 and exploitation at 55%. However, we can get the exact same yield if we set the minimum length around 400 millimeters with the same exploitation rate. Now, how is that possible? Well, um, we've got the same exploitation rate, but now we're letting the fish grow bigger. So we have the same effort but we grab the fish when they reach 280 millimeters, over a year we're going to get this maximum yield. Whereas if we have the same fishing rate, but we allow them, we can't take them until they get to be 400 millimeters, okay, we're catching fewer fish, but they're going to be much bigger on average. And it turns out that whether we take them when they're small or whether we take them when they're big, with that same exploitation rate, 55%, we're going to get the exact same yield. So 
That's how these things can relate in a complex manner to sort of give you the same answer. And again, that's why we need the models because you can kind of picture this in your head. Yeah, if I take them when they're small, I'm going to get a lot of fish that are small. But if I take them when they're bigger, I'm going to get fewer fish, but they're bigger. Which one is better? Well, you throw it into the computer. The computer does all these things and says, well, this particular values, they're exactly the same. Okay. But what you really are going to do is say, look, we could set this at 55% and we can get that maximum yield, but with less effort, we can also get that same maximum yield. So if we set the minimum length to about 340 millimeters and we set exploitation to around 40%, we're going to get the exact same yield. And so that's the most efficient point. If you can get the same yield with less effort, that's what you want. So when you look at these isoplasts, we're always looking at this, the, the line that would, that would be a tangent right here at the far left edge. That's going to be the most efficient point where you're getting the maximum yield with the minimum effort. And that's another advantage of having this model. Of course, we also might say, look, we don't want to maximize the yield. We want to set the maximum lower for other biological reasons or for other reasons, right? So it's, we want to, to have a lower total yield every year. So we just find the tangent on a different yield isopleth, and that's still going to give us the most efficient way to get that biomass of fish out of the water. Um, so it looks like that got cut off there. Um, so our minimum um, total length is going to be about 300 millimeters. Fishing efforts about 0.26 uh, or thereabouts. That is going to be the most efficient way to get this amount of yield, somewhere between 11 and 13 uh, kilograms per year. And again, that's you know we could get the same yield by increasing both the total length, the minimum length, and the fishing effort. We could lower the minimum length and fish harder, so we're going to be getting more fish at a smaller size, but both of those ways would actually give us the same, both of those ways would give us the same yield, but they both require harder fishing. Why not fish less and get the same yield? That's the idea. So there's a lot going on here. Um, again, this is why we use models. Okay, last part that you can, another thing that you can do here with FAST um, is looking at recruitment. We've been looking at yield. Now we can also look at recruitment. And we can just sort of look in, in general terms as how does the population change as recruitment varies because we know that recruitment's variable, right? We know there's uh, a wide swings in year classes from year to year, usually based upon, say, you know, environmental variables, what have you. Um, so FAST allows us to look at these effects in varied recruitment over a long time period. And so here you've got uh, the year, so this has been modeled out over a 50-year period, and you've got the number of fish in the population, and you see that it's, it's not a smooth curve because FAST is, is modeling um, some stochasticity or some randomness into this. So it's using what you know as uh, you would go out and you would look at year class strength in this population. And what's the, the weakest year class we've had and the strongest year class and what's the average year class and, and how long, what kind of a, you know, cycle is there, uh, how often do we get strong year classes versus weak year classes? All those data, you can put them into, into FAST. It'll uh, model them in a random manner, which makes them, um, the data aren't random. It uses random sampling from actual data, which is a very strong way of modeling the results. And so you can get a kind of a feel for how that changes in recruitment, typical changes in recruitment are going to affect your population size. 
You could also look at the um, the quality of the individuals in the population. So here we're looking at PSD, right? We're looking at our proportional stock density over years as recruitment varies. And so, you know, as recruitment dips, then you've got fewer fish and the other remaining ones get bigger and so on and so forth. And that's another thing that um, the models in FAST will allow you to do. So this is just an idea of some of the things you can do with FAST. This is just a side note here in this particular model. I think it's kind of interesting. You've got some pretty steady oscillations occurring. And remember, this is not a, um, a solving of equations here. There's some stochasticity, stochasticity there's some randomness <laughs> built in, um, stochasticity, thank you, built into this model, uh, which is makes it a little bit more realistic. And even with that, you see this kind of um, oscillation that you see in ecology sometimes, which I think is kind of interesting that you get these um, oscillations like that over a long period. Um, okay, last thing you can do with FAST is modeling the SPR. Remember, this is the spawning potential ratio. Um, gives you an insight into recruitment overfishing. And so we can vary different um, uh, values of fishing effort, different minimum lengths, and we can see how that's going to affect the SPR. Um, again, recruitment overfishing can be more serious than growth overfishing. So here's a, um, a graph from that same paper looking at shovel-nosed sturgeon um, across three length limits. And you'll see that we held conditional mortality saw, uh, steady at 5%. You've got conditional fishing mortality, or you know, just pretty much the same as exploitation on the y-axis, x-axis, on the x-axis. And you've got spawning potential ratio on the y-axis, which you see starts at, z at 100% with zero conditional fishing mortality. Remember, spawning potential ratio is the ratio of the eggs that are produced in a fished population relative to what you would get in an unfished population. So with a fishing mortality of a fishing, conditional fishing mortality of zero, that's an unfished population. And so of course your ratio is one. So they all start out at one, but then as we add fishing and we get more fishing mortality, some of those fish that you pull out are female and you're pulling them out before they spawn as much as we would have expected them to spawn. Therefore, there are not as many eggs in the population as you would expect had you not gone fishing, right? And so as fishing pressure gets heavier and heavier, you're pulling more and more of those females out. You're pulling them out earlier and earlier and the SPR goes down and down and down, okay? So you look at these horizontal lines here. The dotted one represents a 30% SPR, and the dashed one represents a 40% SPR. Remember, that's that critical zone. Above 40% SPR, it seems like populations do a pretty good job of sustaining themselves, and it's a sustainable fishery and you're not going to get recruitment over fishing. Um, 30 to 40 is kind of a critical zone. Then below 30 is where you're going to get recruitment over fishing. Again, remember that these vertical bars represent the uh, typical fishing pressure that we see, the range of fishing pressure that we see on the sturgeon in the Mississippi River. And then of course, each line represents a different length limit, triangles being the longest length limit, circles being the shortest length limit. So what do we have? If we look at that, let's look at um, the longest length limit. So you can't take a sturgeon until it gets really, really big and really, really old. What's that mean for the SPR? Well, you know, sturgeon take a long time to reach sexual maturity. They live a long time. Those females might spawn several times. So if you have to wait until she's really big before you can yoink her out, that means she's going to get a spawn several times and she's going to be bigger, so she's going to produce more eggs. And consequently, with that longer length limit, you would expect that there are more eggs in the population relative to an unfished one, and your SPR is higher, and that's what you get, right? The SPR drops,
And as we fish harder and harder, the SPR drops because you are catching more fish. However, for the most part, you stay above this critical 40% line. And so you have a sustainable fishery. Only when fishing rates get, you know, again, they have to more than double. And then you start to get into this, this danger zone where you might get recruitment overfishing, but you never drop below that 30%. So it's possible if you allow those fish to grow very big, that you can fish really, really hard for them and never get recruitment overfishing. And you'll remember that with that longer length limit, you also got um, really high yields from them too. Let's look at the shortest length limit. So now we're pulling the sturgeon out when they're very small, when they're very young. So we're pulling them out before they get a chance to spawn, or they only maybe spawn once or twice before we pull them out of the river. And so there's a lot fewer eggs being produced. And so you see that the spawning potential drops off very quickly with just slight increases in fishing pressure. And if you look at what the estimated minimum fishing pressure on the Mississippi, which is this first vertical line, you see that it intersects that line well below 30% SPR. So what does that mean? That means that if the, the, the estimated fishing pressure, you know, the lowest estimated fishing pressure we have, if you use that length limit, they're still taking the fish out too soon. Even with that lowest fishing effort, you're taking out too many females too soon and you have the potential for recruitment overfishing because your SPR is dropping below that 30, right? So think about that again. You've got the lowest estimated fishing pressure that we can estimate, and they're, but if they're allowed to take the fish at a small size, they're going to take out so many of them that you have the chance that, that the remaining ones won't be able to replace what's taken out and the population could crash. And if fishing pressure is higher, and if it's, and again, we're being conservative, so it's likely higher, and as you get higher fishing pressure, it's well below 30%, hell, it's, heck, it's below 20%, all right? And that is serious recruitment overfishing, and so that is a big concern. And um, if you look at the minimum, or the, the middle proposed um, length limit, you see again, in this zone where you have the, the kind of estimated fishing pressure that we see, you're flirting with recruitment overfishing. So what's the take home message? The first take home message is this is how we use these models to evaluate potential regulations and to understand our population. This is what you do with FAST. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a there, you're seeing a lot more of this because they made this program and they made these models accessible to a lot more fisheries managers. There are other ways that we can use these models, but what I've shown you is the most typical ways. For this particular problem, what does this suggest? Um, it suggests that we need a longer length limit on those sturgeon in order to avoid this recruitment overfishing. And even, say, you kept the smaller length limit in, you'd have to reduce fishing pressure quite a bit in order to avoid recruitment overfishing. And, and so you'd have very, very few people actually even going out into the river. And just to review, how do these models work? What are they based upon? They're based upon the number of fish at age and the size of the fish at age and the growth rates of the fish at age. How come when we go out and sample, what do we do when we sample fish? We get their length, we get their weight, and we get their age. Why do we do that? right here, because we can use those, throw them into these models, and get a, a deeper understanding of our population. Are the models perfect? Of course not. No model is perfect, right? Models are better than a guess. They're one tool in the toolbox. There are assumptions that go with these. Um, a lot, but a lot of people think these models are worthless or they're invalid because, you know, there's some assumptions built in, like you think about the assumptions that go with, uh, our mortality estimates, you know, assumptions of constant recruitment, things like that. Um, 
aren't necessarily always held. That doesn't all that doesn't invalidate the model. You have to take these results um, in the context of all those other factors, but they do help to illustrate what sorts of phenomena are going on in our population. And you'll notice that we look at a range of different values and we think that the true uh, results and the true meaning is somewhere within this range and that helps us to get a really good feel for our population based upon the data that we've collected. And so there is a value to these models. Don't take them as the gospel truth, but don't ignore them either. And I want you to um, to have some exposure to these types of models in FAST. If you ever are interested in using FAST, I do have some instructions typed up. It is fairly easy to use. I do expect that somebody's going to come up with a way to do this in R at some point. Um, I did want to introduce you to a lot of the terminology, and so that was the goal of this lecture. And that's all I have on modeling in FAST. Thanks a lot, and I will see you later.